just to make sure I'm going to go ahead and introduce you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. <laughs> My name is Martha Cole. I'm the Outreach and Interpretation Program Manager here at the Montana Historical Society. It's my great privilege to introduce uh, my collaborator, my former boss, Ellen Baumler. Um, Ellen, <laughs> who really needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Ellen earned her PhD in English, Classics, and History from the University of Kansas. She was the interpretive historian at the Montana Historical Society from 1992 until her retirement in 2018. She's a longtime member of the Humanities Montana Speakers Bureau, a 2011 recipient of the Governor's Award for the Humanities, and was co-curator of the Society's award-winning exhibit, Forgotten Pioneers, about Montana's Chinese history. She's the author of many, many books and articles on diverse Montana topics. Her most recent book is The Life of the Afterlife in the Big Sky State, A History of Montana Cemeteries, which was published by the University of Nebraska Press in 2021. So today she'll be talking to us about Jewish communities in Montana. So please welcome Ellen Bummler. Thank you, Martha, for that nice introduction. I do appreciate it. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, so I'm not Jewish, but I have had the honor of preparing a couple of um, National Register nominations for properties, landmark properties here in Helena that are related to our Jewish community. And I've discovered that Montana really has a very, very rich and little known history of its Jewish communities. So I'm gonna share some of that with you today. Some of, it, some of you may already know some of this, um, but I think in order to tell the story properly, we have to uh, first lay the groundwork by looking at the larger national picture, and then at the West in general, and then focus on Montana, and especially the first Jewish communities at um, Virginia City, Helena, and then Butte especially Helena, because that's where we all are. Um, and then we'll briefly explore the later Jewish communities across the state. So for those of you like me who are not uh, Jewish, there are three branches of Judaism, Reform, Orthodox, and Conservative. Those are the three different congregations or branches. And even where there was a congregation, or even today is a congregation of one branch, there were always or are always individuals or families that practiced one of the other branches. So um, the Jewish population in 1840 was only 15,000. But by 1860, this small ethno-religious group had rapidly grown in the United States to 150,000, much more significant population. This is a miniature daily prayer book that was printed in Germany in 1842 for travelers who came to America by ship. It is the first of three editions published between 1840 and 1860. And that was a period when Jews, especially from German lands, immigrated to this country by the tens of thousands. Political unrest and economic hardship were primary motivating factors for this really large migration. Entire villages migrated to America and were processed at Castle Garden in New York City. By the time Ellis Island was established in 1892, um, Jews were an integral part of many um, American communities and cities across the United States. The California gold rush of the 1850s saw Jewish peddlers and merchants play a really important role as providers and provisioners and exchange agents, dominating the clothing, dry goods, liquor, and tobacco sales businesses. It wasn't easy for these folks who traveled from camp to camp or conducted businesses in bustling western boom towns. Dispersion posed significant problems for um, uh, religious problems for Jews. Without a minion or a prayer quorum, they couldn't worship. They couldn't properly worship. 
nor could peddlers or, sail or settlers or farmers, ranchers, who were living apart from other Jewish folks, easily conform to the rhythm of Jewish life. So its weekly Sabbath was on Saturday, which posed a problem, and holidays fell on American uh, work days. One such isolated peddler wrote in his uh, diary this prayer, and I quote, Thou knowest my thoughts, thou alone knowest my grief, when on Sabbath's eve I must retire alone to my, to my lodging, and on Saturday morning carry my pack on my back, profaning the holy day. I can't live as a Jew. Another calculated that over the period of three years, he was able to observe the Sabbath, the Sabbath properly only uh, less than 10 times. So it was difficult. New York, whoops, New York City was the largest Jewish community, um, and San Francisco was the second largest, um, where Jews established benevolent societies, synagogues, and consecrated burial grounds. The Temple Emmanuel that you see there in the center of the photo was built in 1866, and it towered over the San Francisco skyline, and it was the very first thing that new arrivals saw in their ships as they passed through the Golden Gate. Goods sent to mining camps of the Pacific Northwest often originated in San Francisco, and Jewish merchants formed partnerships with links to brothers, uncles, and cousins that formed a far-reaching chain. Some became miners and followed the gold rushes. Um, earnings in the form of gold dust and nuggets often went back to networks of family employers in San Francisco um, at gold uh, as gold discoveries at Nevada, Colorado, and then Montana opened other mining communities, Jews seized these entrepreneurial opportunities and they became cowboys, barbers, tailors, jewelers, bankers, doctors, attorneys, and cattlemen. While peddling was a common um, starting point for many 19th century Jewish immigrants, it was especially in the roles of merchant and provider that actually offered a stepping stone for immigrants from, from poor villages in Poland, Germany, Prussia, and Austria. The roles of merchant and provider offered a golden opportunity to move on to other entrepreneurial uh, pursuits and rapidly gain economic stability and prom prominent civic status within a single generation, which never could have happened back home. In the East and in the West, Jewish business owners contributed to local economies and founded empires like Adam Gimbel, who started out peddling notions, and of course Levi Strauss, whose jeans, denim jeans made Levi's a household word. In remote Montana, some of the most isolated places in the American West, Jews began to establish communities and became a vital part of Montana's very diverse melting pot. Jewish merchants and peddlers found their way to the very first boom town of Bannock. Samuel Schwab, for example, was born in Rimpar, Bavaria, and he rode the very first stage from Salt Lake City to Bannock in 1863, bringing goods to peddle to the miners. As, at, um, as Virginia City, Montana boomed, businessmen like Samuel Schwab moved to the new community. Jewish immigrants left indelible marks there in several ways. Dry goods merchant Solomon Content was one of 11 Jewish businessmen when he built the town's most impressive uh, commercial building in 1864. Content's Corner today is a primary resource in the Virginia City National Historic Landmark. Another Jewish merchant, Gumpert Goldberg, left his name stenciled over the doorway of his Wallace Street dry goods store, although unfortunately it has now been overwritten. Uh, we know this building today as the McGovern store. But uh, the Jewish community in Virginia City kept their traditions on the frontier, and in 1865, Mrs. Goldberg prepared a Passover feast at sundown for all the Jewish residents of Virginia City. In addition to his dry goods store, Louis Hirschfield um, provided, an, uh, provided an important service and established one of the very first banks. 
storing gold as well as exchanging gold dust for currency. And during Montana's turbulent first years at Alder Gulch, Nevada City, of course, was a rival sister community to Virginia City. And it was there that uh, the famous uh, Ives trial, hanging of George Ives, took place. And after that, the vigilantes organ organized and the group included Jews. Ben Ezekiel was born to Jewish parents in England, served as one of the two sentries guarding the prisoner during the Ives trial. Ezekiel, Ezekiel went on to public office and law enforcement as a territorial legislator and served as chief, clerk, chief clerk of the House of Representatives several different times. Um, Samuel Schwab, who I mentioned before, like Ezekiel, was also civically um, active and was listed in the roster as a vigilante. By the mid-1860s, some report that as many as 30,000 people were living in Alder Gulch. Uh, we have no way of knowing if that's really accurate, probably between 10,000 and 30,000. But the substantial Jewish community briefly very briefly formed a Hebrew benevolent society, which was active only long enough to plan, plan a consecrated Hebrew burial ground. Uh, Virginia City's first plat map, which wasn't published until 1868, clearly shows the planned Hebrew cemetery. However, not all elements on the plat map came to fruition. Um, up there in the corner, left-hand corner, is the Capitol, which was never built there. And in the lower left-hand corner is the Episcopal Church, which also was never built there, at least not that one. Um, and so here is an enlarged view showing the, uh, <laughs> the Jewish cemetery. There are no records of any Jewish deaths or burials in Virginia City or even in Madison County in the 1860s. And the Benevolent Society never purchased the ground uh, planned for this cemetery. Most of the Jewish community, along with the Benevolent Society, had moved to Last Chance to Helena by 1865, long before this plat map was published. The information was way outdated by the time it was printed, and the cemetery property never saw Jewish own ownership, and it's still owned by the city of Virginia City. Russian-born Isidore Strasburger arrived at Bannock in May of 1863 and soon moved on to Virginia City, along with others. He was one of few, though, who stayed and was active, uh, active as a merchant there for the next 20 years. In 1883, he transferred to Bozeman, but finding no Jewish community there, he moved on to Butte with his large family in 1885 and um, there he became a well-known furniture dealer and died in 1907. But the interesting thing about Strasburger is that he married Rachel Cohen in 1867 in Virginia City. Their wedding illustrates how Jewish communities kept their traditions on the, the frontier without a rabbi. There was a, it was uh, actually a little bit scandalous because the couple's friends arranged a civil ceremony which was required by law in the absence of a uh, religious official. They secretly abducted the bride since Rachel's parents had already made a match for her and opposed the marriage. So after the couple was legally married, um, the parents gave in and gave the couple a beautiful proper wedding. In the absence of a rabbi, a merchant served as the acting rabbi and conducted the service in Hebrew with all the, all the traditional rites that were required. Territorial Governor Green Clay Smith and 140 citizens, most of them not Jewish, were guests. All remained with their hats on according to Orthodox custom. So it's kind of an, an interesting frontier wedding. With new gold discoveries, the population leapfrogged from Bannock to Virginia City and then to Last Chance. By 1866, most early residents had moved to Last Chance, renamed Helena. And these included most Jewish businessmen, and you'll probably recognize some of these names, Jacob Feldberg, Gumpert Goldberg, Louis Hirschfield, David and um, Moses Morris, Marcus Listner, Louis Kaufman, and Samuel Schwab. 
Isidore Strasburger and Solomon Content were the few that actually stayed in Virginia City. Ben Ezekiel also remained in Virginia City because that was then the territorial capital and he was attached to territorial government. But in 1875, when the capital moved to Helena and for, uh, Helena from Virginia City, of course, Virginia City uh, government moved and the town was pretty much deserted, which is why Isidore Strasburger finally gave up and went elsewhere. As at Virginia City and Bannock, Helena included many Jewish businesses, like the Morris Brothers Crockery Store and the Sands Brothers Dry Goods. Marcus Listner operated the International Hotel for many years. Samuel Schwab and his partner, son-in-law, um, Edward Zimmerman ran the Cosmopolitan Hotel. Israel Israel, Herman Gans, and Jacob Feldberg each had retail clothing businesses. Louis Kaufman invested his Alder Gulch mining profit, profits in um, the Helena meat market. Ben Ezekiel also stayed in Virginia City, which was then the capital, um, as I said before, but then he moved uh, also to Helena. So, um, Uh, Louis Hirschfeld established the bank, one of the first banks in uh, Helena, and um, by 1890, it was quite an operation, and he had many, many, many partners, uh, both Jews and Gentiles. So in 1866, Jewish businessmen, most of them from Virginia City, uh, established Helena's Hebrew Benevolent Society. These societies formed across the United States wherever there was a substantial Jewish population. Um, nothing of Virginia City's brief society survives that we know of, that we have discovered, but Helena's organization is very well documented and preserved in the archives here at the Montana Historical Society. This is one page from 1867. The records span the period from 1866 to 1943. They tell us a lot about the Jewish community and the challenges that it faced. Although Helena's Jews had neither synagogue nor rabbi, as was often the case in the West, the Benevolent Society bound the group together. Members maintained Jewish holidays, they conducted prescribed rituals, and they assisted the needy. It's interesting, the, the, the line that I've drawn there at the bottom, through the, um, the guy who was the president in 1867 was Saul Starr. You might recognize that name. He becomes a, a pretty prominent character in the uh, HBO series Deadwood. Yeah, with, partnering with uh, Sheriff Bola, a Gentile. So a major purpose of the society was to establish and maintain Hebrew burial grounds. The Minute Book details the founding of the Home of Peace um, in 1867 and its first burials. It is Montana's first Jewish cemetery, and the original fence still surrounds the property placed in 1867. The first two burials were reinterments uh, from the Mining Camp Cemetery, which was where Central School is today, since there was no Hebrew cemetery at the time that these first two guys died. The Home of Peace is the oldest active Jewish cemetery in Montana, and it's Helena's oldest preserved cemetery, even older than Benton Avenue, which dates to 1870. So this plot map shows the first 12 burials. Why they're at this odd angle, uh, I don't know, uh, but the deceased were not buried in the order that they're numbered either. Um, uh, not all the graves were marked, as was common back then, uh, but here is the current plot map, um, which, is, which is interesting. You'll notice that um, uh, later in the 1970s and until fairly recently, um, there were, where that line is, is where that, those original burials were, and that area was leased to the school district as a practice football field. So the tombstones that, that did mark some of those graves were removed, and uh, actually it was, it seems like it was a desecration, but actually it kept the uh, cemetery mode, that area of it mode, and manicured, so it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. 
1869, a situation arose that demonstrates how the society grappled with questions of religious propriety without the counsel of a rabbi. A special meeting was held to discuss uh, the death and burial of Mary Goldman. She was not Jewish by birth, but by adoption and by choice. Her age isn't given, but we know that she was in her girlhood years uh, and apparently had not converted or was too young to have done so. Her place of burial and the lack of a rabbi to resolve the question is presumably why there was more than a week's delay in her, uh, in her interment. After a lot of discussion uh, that we can read about in the uh, minute book, it was finally decided that because of her innocence and her intent, she was granted burial in the Hebrew cemetery. Her spectacular funeral was the largest in Montana to date, Four horses draped and plumed in black drew the hearse. 30 single and double carriages and buggies, the teams of many of them also plumed in black, uh, followed and 40 horsemen drew up the rear. It's quite a, quite a spectacle. So here's um, this plot map again. You can see Mary Goldman's burial there, your, her, her, um, her grave there. During this early period, Jews and other communities who died were sent to Helena for burial. That included Solomon Content of Virginia City, who died in 1870, and B. Wolf of Deer Lodge, who died in 1872. Both of those are uh, noted with arrows on the, uh, the, those 12 interments, which I think is pretty interesting. So Helena's location, as we all know, along this narrow gulch uh, where the wind often roars through, um, amplified the greatest fear of all mining, camp, uh, mining camps, that of fire. And Helena suffered uh, nine different conflagrations at least between about 1867 and 1874, like this one in 1872. Marcus Listener's International Hotel burned so many times that it was nicknamed the Phoenix. And it's kind, of, it's kind of interesting that his home also burned, you know, last summer. It was kind of really tragic um, over on State Street. Uh, and Jacob Feldberg became a local hero. During the fire, during a fire of 1871, as Feldberg's own business on Main Street burned for I don't know how many times, um, he asked the fireman what he could do to help. He was, a, he was a very small statured person, and so the fireman told him he was too little to help and told him just to go away and leave them alone. So he was trudging up the, up the Broadway Hill to his home on Fifth Avenue and noticed burning embers that were being carried by the wind landing on his neighbor's rooftops. Quickly, he organized bystanders into a bucket break brigade, jumped from rooftop to rooftop, and saved the neighborhood. He was still remembered, as you can see, in 1937 for his heroism. He was long known as Helena's Paul Revere because he warned the neighborhood that the fire was coming. His home uh, is still standing. Uh, it was built a little bit after this fire in 1875 or so. Um, but. Um, it is uh, listed in the National Register as part of a historic district there. As Helena endured these devastating fires, it really was the Jewish community that helped keep the mining camp solvent. Many Jewish merchants uh, and businessmen had ties to financial networks that reached well beyond the Montana frontier, allowing them access to financial resources to build, sometimes again and again. And these well-connected Jewish businessmen also financially helped many others, both Jews and Gentiles, get started in business. Unlike some other places, uh, the Fraternal Order of Freemasonry, which was so important to the founding of Montana, um, embraced Jewish members, bringing Jews and Gentiles together in fraternal um, brotherhood. And by 1877, 20% of Helena's Board of Trade, which was the forerunner of today's Chamber of Commerce, was Jewish. In 1881, Abram Sands, a Jew, was elected president of the organization, 
Jews served in public offices. Marcus Listener, for example, was elected to the city council six different times. And by 1900, Jewish businesses like Auerbach and Gans and Klein were important parts of the fabric of Helena's main street. Jewish residents maintained some of Helena's most beautiful homes and um, were not only well respected, but were really embraced by the Gentile community. Jews were lawyers, doctors, judges, bankers, merchants, service providers, and business partners with non-Jews. Louis Kaufman, for example, partnered with Gentile Louis Stadler uh, to form one of Montana's largest cattle operations uh, in the Jew Judith Basin. Jewish banking houses were historically instrumental to the process of capital, uh, capital formation in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Modern banking in Europe and the United States was certainly influenced by Jewish financiers, such as the Rothschild and Warburg families. And Jews were major contributors to the establishment of important investment banks on Wall Street. J&W uh, Seligman and Company, founded in 1864, was a very prominent US investment bank from the 1860s to the 1920s. The Seligman family financed a couple of railroads and the Panama Canal. Albert Joseph Seligman came to Montana in 1881 from New York City to oversee his family's heavy investments in Montana's mining enterprises. Albert Seligman and his family's financial backing became important in the development of Helena and Montana. Uh, with the, the panic, the economic panic, silver panic of 1893, many wealthy Montanans lost their fortunes. Uh, Albert Seligman and his money helped save a number of Montana businesses that might otherwise have closed. His, spe whoops. his spectacular home in Helena, designed by nationally renowned architect Cass Gilbert in 1886, is one of the truly truly lavish homes on Helena's west side. The prestigious Montana Club also, founded in 1885 for the advancement of art and culture, counted prosperous, uh, well-educated Jews among its members like uh, clothier Herman Gans of the firm of Gans and Klein. By the 1880s, uh, Helena's Jewish population remained organized but without either a rabbi or a synagogue. Services were held in various meeting halls and Helena churches. Rabbi Samuel Schulman came to, to lead Helena's congregation in the late 1880s. Rabbi Schulman brought with him German Reform Judaism, which fit well with Helena's many German uh, Jews of German extraction. Under Rabbi Schulman, the congregation's dream of building, a, or building the first temple amidst the Rockies actually reached fruition. A committee formed to teach the architects, um, who were uh, Frederick Heinlein and Thomas F. Matthias, who were not Jewish, what elements the temple needed to have, what it should look like, and what was uh, necessary to, uh, to build um, inside. Uh, the Moorish style building was stunning. Um, it was an architectural anomaly that added greatly to the cosmopolitan image that Helena really wanted to promote at the time. Governor K. Ross Toole, who was not Jewish, actually he was a converted Catholic, um, laid the cornerstone of the first temple uh, between St. Paul, Minnesota and Portland, Oregon. A crowd of visitors from all different creeds and from many distant places attended the ceremony. Inscribed with the date 5651, according to the Hebrew calendar, the granite marker was placed in the northeast corner uh, and remains there today. Inside still are, I'm sure, the names of congregation members and cards of those who attended the ceremony, coins, a quartz specimen, copies of the local newspaper. Keyhole windows and twin towers once crowned the exotic um, uh, star-spangled onion domes once crowned these two square towers here. Uh, it's my theory that they were 
they were copper and they were melted down when they resurfaced the capital um, in about 19, <laughs> in the 1930s when copper was hard to come by. But that's my theory anyway. Um, the Helena congregation reached its peak in the 1890s. Rabbi Shulman, whose legacy remains in the temple that he helped build, moved on. There were several other rabbis that came but um, by the 1910s, educational opportunities and employment took many of the second generation away from Montana, and the close-knit population then began to diminish. In 1910, uh, the cemetery, the Home of Peace Cemetery Association, which was the descendant of the Hebrew Benevolent Society, merged with the congregation Emmanuel. The combining of these two entities is indicative of the, the declining number of members as more burials at the Home of Peace began to cluster together and once living units are now connected eternally with brick walkways as in a village. It's really very charming, uh, charming cemetery and, and very unusual. However, <clears throat> Helena continued to embrace its Jewish community the Flegelman sisters, Frida and Belle, I'm sure a lot of you know about them, were college-educated daughters of Romanian Jewish immigrants. They were both dynamic suffragists, uh, and long after their passing, they remain, remained very special community treasures to a lot of us Helena women. But in 1911, when the YWCA was founded, Frida Flegelman was its first um, secretary and one of its founders. Frida was so instrumental in the success that the Helena YWCA chose not to affiliate with the national organization. Its rule that non-Christians couldn't participate in management meant that Frida, who was not Jewish, could have no role. And so in 1972, Helena's YWCA was the only independent chapter in the United States and it did not affiliate with the National YWCA until after the death of Frida in the 1980s. Jeanette Rankin, the first woman elected to Congress in 1917, took Frida's sister, Belle, with her to Washington, D.C., and Belle wrote all of, her, uh, all of Jeanette's speeches. But during the early 1900s, the waning of Helena's Jewish population is in further evidence. As marriages between Jews and Gentiles among families became more frequent, cemetery rules began to relax. Before uh, 1916, only persons of the Jewish faith could be buried in the home of peace. The Board of Trustees realized, though, that intermarriage was becoming prevalent and changed the rule to include Gentile sp spouses and their unmarried children and to allow, allow non-Jewish funerals. Um, and that remains the case today at the Home of Peace. Part of the cemetery property though, and it's really kind of sad to see that, um, uh, remains undeveloped, but you can see that it was planned as part of the, uh, the cemetery expansion. Meanwhile, we need to backtrack to Butte which rose from a struggling gold mining camp to a booming industrial copper mining center. Prominent Jewish clothing merchant Henry Jacobs came to fledgling Butte in 1876 and was elected mayor in 1879. Jacobs, Jacobs built Butte's first brick home. He also served as city treasurer and school trustee. And Butte's third mayor, H.L. Frank, was also Jewish and served two elected terms from 1880, uh, 1885. While Helena's earliest population came from Virginia City, a substantial community of immigrant Jews developed a little bit later at Butte. The Hebrew Benevolent Association of Butte organized before the formal congregation, as was the case in Helena. Although there were some Jewish businesses like Gans and Klein that you see here that operated both in Butte and in Helena, Jews um, attracted to Butte had different backgrounds from those who settled in Helena. In 1881, Butte's first wave 
of Jewish citizens had formed a Hebrew benevolent association and celebrated the community's first holy day services. The association established the B'nai Israel Cemetery, which opened in 1885. The second wave of Jews, refugees of religious persecution, uh, came from Russia, Poland, um, Romania, Hungary, and Ukraine. Unlike the Germans, were devoutly orthodox. And they brought with them a bias towards Butte's growing reform movement. Butte's Jewish community quickly split into orthodox and reform. And the orthodox group then further split into two other groups. A kosher butcher served the needs of the orthodox community. Helena's Jewish population was diminishing, but Jewish families continued to immigrate and settle in Butte. In the early 1900s, estimates of Butte's Jewish community ranged from 500 to 1,000. Um, oops. As Americanized relatives um, encouraged family members to immigrate, the population grew. And Butte's B'nai Israel Reform Congregation formally organized in 1897, and the synagogue then was dedicated in 1903. Previously, the congregation had worshiped in the Carpenters Union Hall and in the Mountain View Episcopal Church. By 1902, the Orthodox community had converted the German Lutheran Church into the, into the Edith Israel Congregation Synagogue. But underground mining threatened the building and it had to be demolished, and I don't think there are any pictures of that synagogue that I could find anyway. Um, the congregation then moved to the Knights of Pythias Hall until 1955 when that building burned, and then Butte's two congregations, the Adith Israel and the B'nai Israel, joined together in the 1960s. The 1903 B'nai Israel um, Temple is the oldest synagogue in Montana, <clears throat> still in use as a synagogue, and one of only few in the United States to retain its Moorish-style onion dome. In addition to the Masonic Lodges, Butte's unifying Judaic organization was the B'nai B'rith, which helped promote social contact between the disparate groups in Butte and also um, Jews in other Montana towns. Founded in New York in 1843, the International Fraternal Organization continues to advocate for Israel, provide humanitarian relief, and better the lives of people around the globe. As in Helena and other Montana communities, the various congregations had women's and youth groups, and among the 500 Butte Masons were many Jews, some of them of the very, very highest degree. Women belonged to the women's counterpart, the Eastern Star. Uh, Butte further had Jewish youth organizations, and for several decades in the early 1900s, it also had a Hebrew school. These immigrants loved their country, their adopted country and its freedom. Many Flegelmen, whose daughters, Frida and Belle, I've mentioned already, came from Romania, as I said before. And um, this is Minnie's hand-sewn hand good luck quilt, and it sort of illustrates the point. Although Helena's Jewish community diminished, one Helena couple made significant statewide contributions during this time. Saul Hepner, who was a prosecuting county attorney, a Helena city attorney, and a state legislative representative, was a past Grand Master of the Mason's Grand Lodge. His wife, Josephine, was a Grand Matron of the Grand Chapter Order of the Eastern Star of Montana. In their individual capacities, as the highest degree Masons, the pair was instrumental in the founding of the Masonic Home in 1911 which originally was a home for widows, children, and elderly um, whose family members were Masons. The home is still in, in um, uh, operation today uh, for elderly Masons. And the road approaching the facility is named the Saul Hepner Way. In 1900, Josephine Hepner founded and served as president of the Montana Children's Home a non-denominational or orphanage that countered the Catholic St. Joseph's Children's Home and the state orphanage at Twin Bridges. In 1937, 
Jewish businessman Louis Choder gave $200,000 to the children's home, to the Montana Children's Home, to found a children's hospital, and the home then became Choder Children's Hospital. The hospital today provides cutting edge genetic research and counseling and the care and treatment of children suffering from illness, diseases, and other physical, mental, and emotional conditions. It is Montana's only hospital affiliated with the National Children's Miracle Network. Billings also supported a large Jewish population of a distinct character. Founded in the 1880s to serve the railroad, Billings attracted Jews who arrived by train to peddle goods or trade in hides and furs. Billings Jews were economically poorer than those in Helena and Butte, and they didn't usually have family and extended family as many Jews in Helena and Butte did. And Billings Jews experienced much more prejudice than Jews in Helena and Butte. Establishment of the B'nai B'rith Lodge in 1917 was the first step in the organization of the Billings Jewish community. Membership in this organization, as in Butte, drew the Jewish community together. Montana's smaller Jewish communities that had no designated cemetery typically sent their dead elsewhere, as we saw in Virginia City and Deer Lodge. This practice continued. Jews in Billings sent their dead to Butte's B'nai Israel Cemetery. But when the 1918 flu epidemic stressed Butte's resources, the B'nai Israel Cemetery could no longer bury Billings dead. So uh, this prompted an auction to finance a cemetery, and the highest bidder was ask, asked to name the congregation uh, that would buy the land and then maintain it. So Lewis Heron was the highest bidder, and he chose the name Beth Aaron, which was a translation of his name. During the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan was very active in Billings. Anti-Semitism discouraged Jews from mingling with non-Jewish neighbors, and until the 1950s, Jew Jews were even excluded from membership in the Billings Masonic Lodge, the Highlands Golf Club, and the Billings Junior League. During the 1920s and after, the Billings congregation, originally Orthodox, became a mixture of conservative, reform, and Orthodox because the backgrounds of its members were so extremely diverse. Sabbath, ser Sabbath services using, reform prayer book, using the Reform Prayer Book were held on Friday nights in members' homes. The Conservative Prayer Book then served for holidays. Men wore, wore hats uh, during services according to Orthodox tradition, but men and women sat together, which they didn't in Orthodox services. No one kept kosher homes. Services were quick so that the men could adjourn for poker and the women for bridge. <laughs> Card playing in, in Billings uh, during the 1920s and 30s was an obsession with everyone. The newcomers expressed shock at the contentious congregation, but the group persevered and expanded. A temple was finished in 1940 but it was built to look like a residence so that it wouldn't attract too much attention. Although Billings Congregation was originally Orthodox, discovery of, gold, of oil brought newcomers to Billings who were used to reform temples. And so in 1953, they led the movement to join the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, the reform arm of American Jewry. They also hired an ordained reform rabbi. The Billings community was not particularly welcoming in the first half of the 20th century, but gradually Jews became more accepted. And this became evident in the 1990s when the community rallied around their Jewish neighbors. Hate crimes against Jews and other groups set the town on edge. Some of you might remember that in 1993, a brick came hurling through the window of five-year-old Isaac Schnitzer's bedroom. Isaac was fortunately uninjured, um, a menorah in his window, a symbol of the family's celebration of Hanukkah, made the Schnitzers a target of religious bigotry and vandalism. The Schnitzers were among the few uh, 
were among the few Jewish families in Billings at that time. Supremacist groups began to commit uh, brutal hate crimes against various minorities. Billings suffered desec uh, desecration of its Jewish cemetery, telephone threats to Jewish citizens, and swastikas were painted on the home of, a, uh, of an interracial co uh, couple. The Schnitzers were advised to remove the religious symbols from public view. This infringed upon their First Amendment rights, uh, and news reports left Christians wondering what it would be like if a Christmas tree in the windows of their own homes provoked violence. An idea took root. Menorahs like this one published in the Billings Gazette appeared in the windows of some 10,000 homes in Billings, sending a powerful message of community solidarity. Harassment continued, and some non-Jewish citizens suffered vandalism, but gradually the perpetrators withdrew. The next December in 1994, families in Billings again displayed menorahs, reaffirming their commitment to peace and intolerance. This quiet, courageous message spread and came to be known as the Not In Our Town National Movement. It is a message that continues to reverberate. In uh, 2005, the Billings Congregation Beth Aaron hosted a public open house in its new synagogue. Today, there are active Jewish communities in Billings, Bozeman, Butte, Great Falls, Helena, Kalispell, and Missoula. As of 2014, there were 1,350 Jews and five synagogues in Montana. That might be small, but it is a significant growing percentage. Bozeman and Missoula have both Orthodox and Reform congregations. The Orthodox congregations are more recently established and follow the Chabad Lubavitch Orthodox Hasidic movement. Bozeman's Beth Shalom Reform congregation celebrated its first Passover in 1982, while uh, Missoula's Har Shalom goes back to the 1940s. Although some communities like Bozeman and Missoula did not have an organized congregation until the mid 20th century, that doesn't mean that they didn't have prominent Jews in their communities. Daniel Bandman was an internationally known German-born Shakespearean actor who bought acreage near Missoula in 1884 and introduced Macintosh apples to the region. And another famous Jew who, nev who never lived in Montana, but left a very important legacy was the son of Jewish immigrants. Robert Marshall was an early forester, wilderness preservationist, and wilderness society co-founder. The Bob Marshall Wilderness is named for him. To return to Helena and the Temple Emmanuel for a moment here, in 1937, the state of Montana purchased the temple building from the diminished congregation for a dollar and a promise to keep the building for a good and social purpose. Um, the sanctuary was divided into two floors to house offices and religious symbolism, were, symbolism was removed. And then the building fulfilled its promise um, fulfilled its promise by um, uh, housing the, the Office of Public Welfare until the 1980s. It then sat vacant until the Catholic Diocese of Helena purchased the building at public auction for use as its offices. Oops. Here. Let me go back to that one. So on April 21st, um, On April 21st, 2001, uh, there was a ceremony that marked another milestone in Mon Montana's Jewish history. Uh, Maryland businessman Jerry Klinger, you see there on the uh, right-hand side, whose parents were victims of the Holocaust but had no ties to Montana whatsoever, set in motion members of the Jewish community, Catholic officials, the Montana Historical Society staff, and a handful of descendants of Helena's prominent Jewish pioneers. The building had just been listed in the National Register uh, when this diverse group came together to celebrate the community significance of this regional landmark. 
the late Bishop Robert Morlino of Helena, 92-year-old Sidney Silverman uh, Lindauer, who's in the middle there of the photo, and Joe Schwartz of California, who were both descendants of Helena's early Jewish pioneer families, addressed the gathering in the spirit of that first community ded dedication more than a century ago. During this ceremony, a small bronze plaque commissioned and paid for by Klinger was unveiled and the plaque marked the building's significance uh, and celebrated its 110th anniversary. So Montana's Jewish pioneers faced seemingly insurmountable uh, odds, but although sometimes they were small in numbers, they were mighty as a force in many communities. Times have changed, but uh, some, some things remain the same. And as those early Montanans demonstrated, it was never a very easy road. And it still is not easy for those who wish to follow the Jewish faith. My friend and Jewish mentor, Janet Tatz, has always cautioned me not to make Montana's Jews sound like dinosaurs or relics. You know, as we remember the pioneers who came here and established those early congregations, we historians tend to emphasize the fact that the Jewish populations dwindled into the second and third generations and moved elsewhere. But I think it's really important to remember that they laid the foundation for the new resurging Montana congregations. Our newer communities may not be descendants of those Montana pioneer, pioneering Jews, but they are perpetuating the flame that those who came before first kindled. Helena's pioneer Jews long dream of a temple amidst the Rockies, and Helena's modern Jewish community has that same dream. There is now opportunity to purchase the former Temple Emmanuel, bringing it full circle. With the support of the Catholic Diocese and Bishop Anthony, Austin Anthony Vetter, the Montana Jewish Project is raising money uh, to buy back the building and make this dream a reality. So finally, it's not easy to be Jewish, as I've said before. Rebecca Stanfell, who is there in the audience, um, writes of her experience and really eloquently, and with her permission, I close with her lovely thoughts on becoming Jewish in Montana. She writes, it's not easy to convert to Judaism in Montana, but then the important tasks we undertake in life rarely are. I struggle over whether to eat unkosher meat, including the buffalo burgers I have come to adore. Sometimes I think, how can I do this here? Then I remember the men and women laid to rest in the Montana earth. I think of them gathering around the menorahs on a cold, dark evening. I imagine the light flickering off their smiles. And I know that I, too, can celebrate the miracles of light shining in the darkness of community persisting against the odds, of becoming who I am, where I am. It is, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, because we have, um, a sizable audience also live streaming from home. Um, Ellen's gonna take questions, but I am gonna ask you to raise your hand and I will bring a microphone to you to ask your question so that the folks at home can also uh, participate. And if folks at home have questions, you can type it into the chat and uh, uh, we'll, we'll try to get your questions as well. All right, does anyone have any questions? Just a quick question on how much money is trying to be raised to purchase the... Um, Who would like to the answer building? that? I think that'd be all right. Um, the Montana Jewish Project, as uh, Ellen said, um, with the cooperation of Bishop Vetter, um, signed a sale agreement in November to purchase the synagogue and some pr properties around there for $925,000. Mm -hmm. 
Are there other questions? How do we donate if we want to support that? You. <laughs> <laughs> um, I took the liberty of, um, there's some flyers. I'm happy to hand them out outside afterwards. And that has information. You can also go to the website, Montana Jewish Project. I saw somebody over here. <laughs> it's a workout. <laughs> um, where is Ben Ezekiel buried? Is it in the Helena Jewish Cemetery? Yep, at the Home of Peace. His is one of the older uh, tombstones is still standing there, yes. The question was, uh, or the, uh, yes, where is the cemetery? So if you go down Henderson, like you're going to go to the fairgrounds, um, the street to turn on, it, you, you would turn right on Brady, which leads you actually to Capitol High School, but it's the very first turn on the left, and it's a driveway, and it will take you right there. Hmm? Hi, Ellen. Hi. <laughs> Did you come across Henry Lobel? Oh, Henry, yes. Well, I, I didn't. I couldn't mention everyone, but the Lobels were uh, were very important family here. Yeah, Henry was a yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. I'm just curious about Billings and the degree of anti-Semitism. Do you think that was simply timing, that the KKK was more active by then? Or? The KKK organized in the 1920s, um, 1923, across Montana. And there were something like 40 chapters across, across Montana. But you know, mo in most communities, they were watchdog sort of organizations to make sure that African Americans didn't move out of their neighborhoods, and uh, there were some problems in Missoula um, with a church that was uh, African American church that was located in the middle of a white neighborhood that caused some problems. And usually, there weren't any, there really weren't any, you know, serious problems except in Billings. Um, why that is, I I don't know. One last question. Yeah. Well, first, I just want to thank Ellen very much. She's such an amazing historian. <laughs> thank you, Cher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you've told so many stories about you know marginalized or you know uh, lesser known communities for a very long time. So I just wanted to let people know also that in uh, the same time that there's this wonderful effort to return the Jewish temple to um, more of a use as more of a um, honored s place of worship and culture. In Butte, the temple, mm -hmm. B'nai Israel, is in a legacy process because their um, community has gotten smaller mm -hmm. and they are now working to transition for that to become a part of the Butte um, community and cultural heritage nonprofit and will be a cultural center there. Mm -hmm. And this summer they'll actually be having some events. Excellent. Um, yeah, and so I think it's just really a wonderful time for all of this to be happening in Montana. It really is, um, yep. Yeah, so anyways. Thanks I just for letting us know great. about yeah. that, yeah. All right, well thank you for coming and thank you so much, Ellen.